Still getting settled in, uh, let's uh, begin today's uh, distinguished lecture of the Institute of Microengineering. And today is uh, my uh, distinct pleasure uh, to open uh, this uh, lecture since for the first time we are uh, broadcasting live to Neuchâtel, but also worldwide. So from now on, we hope uh, that you will always be able uh, to uh, click on the link that is provided with the invitation and uh, have uh, access to the live streaming of this distinguished lecture series. Um, also, we will provide the recording uh, with the agreement of our uh, speaker uh, on the website as usual. So without further ado now, I would like to introduce our distinguished lecturer today. It's my great honor and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Satoshi Kawata, uh, who is a Professor Emeritus uh, from Osaka University, uh, where he has been professor since 1993. So aside his position at the university, he also had a uh, position as a scientist and team leader uh, at Riken, the Institute. I'm sure we will hear about uh, his activities there from 2002 to 2015 and he was also involved in starting up a startup company uh, focusing on laser scanning Raman microscopy. It's called Nanophoton Corporation uh, since 2003. So he's intimately know knowledgeable at the forefront in academic and industrial research, but also uh, he knows about the ch challenges involved uh, with a high-tech startup. So this comes also, these activities come with uh, lots of honors. Uh, so he's a fellow of the most important societies in the field, Optical Society of Amer America, SPIE, IOP, and JSAP. And he also has served in these uh, societies. Uh, so he was president of the Jap Japan Society of Applied Physics and the president of the Spectroscopical Society of Japan and has served on uh, many editorial boards and directorial uh, functions uh, throughout his career so far. So, Professor Kavata has been involved in the invention of a number of new concepts in photonics, including aperture-less near-field scanning microscopy, evanescent wave photon pressure, optical uh, CT microscopy, plasma holography, tip-enhanced and deep UV Raman microscopy, and uh, what we certainly will hear about today is two-photon nanofabrication. So we are forward to uh, hearing about these groundbreaking technologies in this talk on optical 3D nanofabrication technologies, looking at top-down and bottom-up approaches. So let's welcome our distinguished lecturer, Professor Satoshi Kawata. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, for your very kind introduction of mine. And, uh, Thank you for your invitation to uh, EPFL Lausanne. This is my second time to come to this campus. The last time was 10 years ago when uh, Olivier Hemaltan organized the Near Field Optics Conference. So this is my second time, but uh, I heard that you, this is broadcasting to North Hotel. I visited there once uh, a few years ago. <laughs> so uh, third time to EPFL. And, uh, <coughs> My talk, actually, I have been mainly now working for uh, deep UV photonics, and uh, we do like a deep UV plasmonics, deep UV resonant Raman spectroscopy, and the deep UV biomolecular analysis and uh, deep UV microscopy and nanoimaging. But today, I won't talk this topics. I would like to, I chose the topics that is in a 3D and nano optics because this topic is more interesting, I hope, to the members of this uh, micro engineering institute. But that this topic is not new one for me, so, so please allow me to give my uh, old study, including uh, some of the new topics as well. So the title is Optical 3D Nanofabrication Technologies. And I talk about uh, two photon engineering and also uh, a bottom-up approach to make a 3D nanostructures, which was done uh, somehow quite recently by us. And if time allows, I would like to talk about 3D plasmonic uh, nanobioimaging. The motivation is the following. Um, I have seen a lot of nanotechnologies, but most of the nanotechnologies are based 
basically 2D te technologies to fabricate uh, surfaces and uh, thin films uh, in nanoscale. And uh, I saw some activities this morning by, by uh, Neil, who made a uh, 3D uh, fabrication. But it's not easy to make real 3D structures. And even uh, photonic crystal, which is known as a uh, uh, structure to make a uh, 3D confinement of photons, is now moving to 2D photonic crystals. And the metamaterial is very 3D bulky uh, materials, but the people now play with uh, uh, meta surfaces. So I have been interested in how we can make nanotechnology in 3D. And uh, I don't know how many people know of this uh, book. This is one of the very first uh, books describing on uh, nanotechnologies. Uh, creations, uh, engines of creation, the coming era of nanotechnologies. In this textbook, uh, in this book published in uh, 1986, Rick Drexler described and or predicted that in the future, that moment, people have an, uh, would have a skill to make a real 3D uh, technology to make an, a 3D whatever micro machines and nano machines. And he predicted in the future people make this kind of 3D micro, micro machines walking inside your body to treat or to, to analyze uh, diseases. And uh, I got very much impressed this uh, book. Even Bill Clinton read this book and made a uh, national, uh, national nanotechnology initiatives. But anyway, uh, so we, I wanted to do this one. And uh, some years after, I have uh, uh, proposed three-dimensional microfabrication is made by two-photon photopolymerization. And uh, we made uh, three D structures with uh, uh, two-photon femtosecond lasers in uh, photopolymerizable resin. And uh, we used that moment hmm, more than 20 years ago, yes. Uh, Right. We use a commercially available photopolymer, which has an absorption in UV, but transparent in visible. Uh, to to solid, this this polymer is an, uh, uh, makes an, a solidification of the uh, resin if you give an UV light. So people use an UV light to, to polymerize the structures, but we wanted to use an uh, infra, near infrared. And. Uh, let me see. The order is of the slider changed. Sorry, I. Let me see. It may be better to explain this one first. Let me somewhere. Yes. So uh, in, if you use a uh, DPV, uh, sorry, UV. You can record the nanostructures by photography uh, in resin on the substrate. But if you use a near infrared, near infrared light uh, uh, pass, passes through your photo resin without any absorption. So you can, you can address the focus beam in a thick volume of the photo resin. But if you have a uh, femtosecond laser with a high peak power, you have a possibility of two photon absorption. And uh, if you have a high numerical aperture lens, only the position of the focus, you have a possibility of two photon absorption, which solidifies the uh, uh, polymer at the position of focus. And uh, you move the laser beam in a uh, polymer. And uh, we made this kind and made an, uh, small structures. And uh, this bull is an, about an, uh, eight micron by five micron. And uh, it was in 3D. And uh, not only making the sculpture, we also made uh, moving machines. And uh, this was a uh, simple uh, spring. And we measured the uh, spring constant if the size is very small enough. And uh, this is very simple experiment, 
And uh, we made a uh, two-photon absorption uh, polymerization to make the structure. Uh, not only the uh, spring, but also this anchor and also the bead. And the moving experiment was done by uh, two-photon, uh, sorry, uh, laser trapping technology. So we keep trapping the uh, particle and release it and uh, move the particle uh, back into the original position and measure the uh, uh, spring constant. So as a result, the structure was very fine and really 3D. And uh, as I told you, it is uh, eight micron long and uh, five micron high. And, uh, but the beam scanning was made at every 50 nanometer step in X, Y, and Z. And to make this structure with an eight micron, it took 30 minutes. We don't polymerize entire body of the uh, bull. We polymerize only the surface, skins of the bulls. And uh, polymerizes and removes the resin outside and gave UV laser to polymerize inside the body. So it took just uh, 30 minutes. And the resolution was uh, 120 nanometer, even though the wavelength, wavelength of the laser was uh, 7, 785, and uh, higher than the uh, limit of the non-linearity of the two-photon absorption. And it is due to not only the uh, non-linearity of the optical non-linearity, but also chemical thresholding in polymerization. So this was a good demonstration to, 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 for people to think that we can play with a 3D nano fabrication using the uh, femtosecond lasers. And many people uh, worked a lot for those kind. And uh, this is uh, the uh, very first demonstration of the, uh, this microbial in comparison with a uh, human hair of a student who made this experiment. So human hair is like uh, this size, and the blue was this small size. So the blue was too small, and even though you can make it by laser beam, you cannot see it by optical microscope. It's too small to see the details. So we brought this to the uh, SEM, same uh, chamber and to see the uh, bull. But this is too small, so we made many bulls and uh, brought them into the uh, vacuum chamber to see them. So this is what we played, we did uh, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, resolution was an, uh, not limited to 120, but it's nearly practically limited to 120. And uh, we made a trick to improve the resolution uh, polymerization uh, has a uh, uh, very uh, significant shrinkage of the structure purposely if you want to do. So by using this shrinkage, the 120 becomes even 120 becomes even 65 nanometer. So we could make the 65 nanometer structures by some some uh, technique. And uh, we have made many structures like a uh, uh, photonic crystal uh, or a diamond lattice. And the uh, size, sorry, there's no size, but so size was not so small. But besides, as many people have done the similar works. And uh, also, uh, we wanted to make an, uh, the uh, identical structures in parallel within a short time because people complained that it took too long time to, to make this kind of structures by drawing the laser beams one by one, one by another. So we used a micro lens array to, to focus the many spots in resin and move the uh, beam to produce the structures and can be in, of course, 3D. So we were interested in making this, how do you say, uh, helical, uh, structure as a uh, helical antenna, but we didn't do much. So uh, we just enjoyed to demonstrate the structures. And uh, yes, and uh, uh, Neil has mentioned that I started up a company, but uh, in 1998, 1999, uh, professors 
were not allowed to be involved with any commercial businesses in Japan. We should be apart from the business. We, we have to do science, not help any private companies, private sections. So that moment we were doing very, uh, we are producing only papers, but not uh, working for companies who are never established startup companies by themselves, by ourselves. But later on, I started up a company with my students. And now we are deeply involved, in particular after the retirement, I'm spending lots of time for that. But anyway, this is one. And uh, also, uh, optical data storage uh, was basically 2D, CD, DVD, uh, blue ray has a very fine uh, dots, but it was in 2D. And uh, if you read the uh, Bill Clinton's uh, statement for a nanotech initiative, he has m mentioned that in, uh, in the future, uh, the uh, to uh, people will make an, uh, uh, data storage with the size of the uh, sugar, sugar cube uh, to record the entire volume, volume of the data of the National Library in US. So we wanted to try to do this, and uh, this, records, this includes the records of many data in 3D, and it is relatable, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the distance between layer by layer was five micron, and uh, this total thickness is the thickness of uh, the, the uh, DVD CD. So we can record 100, uh, sorry, 240 pages in optical disk. And, uh, and uh, we worked a lot with uh, uh, company people to, to do this experiment. And, uh, and uh, experimentally it was successful, but as a business, people don't use any more optical disks, people are happy with them, this uh, semiconductor uh, data storage. So the company moved to the semiconductor memory uh, business. But anyway, we recorded uh, to uh, data to, to, to see, to, for the demonstration, data bits are uh, letters. And uh, B, this plane is a five micron Deep, deeper from the layer A, and uh, this is five micron under, uh, deeper under the B, so, so this is A to Z. But we, can, we were able to record many more data. And the, me uh, the method is the same as two-photon polymerization, but we used a uh, two-photon isomerization. And uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, photo photochromic molecules. The first we used in a, uh, ferroelectric crystals, but in a, uh, photochromic molecules can be also uh, considered as a photorefractive memory. And uh, photochromism means an, uh, uh, color changes by the uh, light illumination. And uh, it changes the uh, uh, isomer, isomer A to B by giving the uh, UV laser, and uh, so if you give an UV laser, UV laser is absorbed, and uh, it turns to isomer B, which has an absorption invisible. And if you give the visible light, it turns back to the isomer A. So this is an, uh, 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 two states, but uh, uh, yes, and uh, we record the data from A to B, and but if you read the data by absorption, reading is nothing different from erasing. So we used a two photon. Uh, sorry, we used a. Uh, uh, sorry, so we, so recording we used a two photon absorption to localize isom uh, isomerization at the position of the focus in 3D. So we used a two photon for recording, and the reading was done by uh, visible light. With, a, with an range where there is no absorption in either case, but the refractive index is different. This one has an absorption here, so the refractive index is high. Uh, here, sorry, this one. 
but here refractive index is low. So by confocal readout, you can read and you can write and read, so it is rewritable. So this is still 3D, rewritable data storage. And uh, what about metamaterials? Metamaterials are not photo isomer, photopolymer, but metal, made of basically metal. These days, people discuss about dielectric uh, metamaterials, but originally, it's an electromagnetic, uh, mag electromagnetic uh, induction system. So metamaterial is a 3D, uh, the next one. Metamaterial is a 3D, uh, this doesn't say metallic, but 3D metallic, uh, mat sorry, materials. Uh, and it is bulky, but complex with the sub wavelength details, uh, typically plasmonic, exhibiting uh, exotic optical properties. So this is a typical uh, structure of metamaterials showing the negative refraction uh, proposed by John Pendry and David Smith. And this is 3D and uh, seems not easy. This is the one that uh, David Smith made the first, but this was for for microwave region, so the wavelength is much longer. So he was able to make this one. But for visible, really difficult to make this 3D, metallic, complex structures, as in uh, bulky materials. But still people have worked a lot, and there are beautiful uh, demonstrations to make uh, 3D structures, 3D metallic structures, uh, and uh, it has a uh, limitation in shapes, but uh, those shapes are called fishnet, and having the many layers, and uh, uh, showing the sort of the uh, metamaterial uh, property, uh, negative refraction in some sense. So many people have worked a lot to make a uh, visible near infrared uh, metamaterials using the uh, lithographic technology, top-down technology. But obviously, it's not easy to make the uh, orbitary uh, 3D uh, structures. So again, I propose to do with uh, two-photon uh, engineering. And in uh, this case, uh, photo reduction. We reduce the metal ions in solution to real metal uh, metals. So in in the solution, we have an, uh, 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 this case, I think silver, silver ions. And by giving the laser beam, at only at the focus of the position, uh, ions is reduced to metal, real metals. And uh, from the bottom, we can make even 3D uh, metal by pyramid structures. And the thickness was like a uh, half micron in this experiment. So we did this kind. Uh, actually, this is not crystal. This is an uh, aggregation. But the uh, uh, resistance is not much high, three times higher than uh, crystal uh, metal. However, there is a limit. It's not easy to make a very large scale uh, metallic structure by this um, top-down approach. So uh, I was thinking if there is a way to make a real three-dimensional complex metallic nanostructures in a large scale. And, uh, we didn't do exactly what we wanted to do, but then, uh, we have, we got, I got an idea. It is an, uh, uh, I got a hint from natural forest. Forest is very complicated, and, uh, and uh, having the many details, it has a fractal geometry, uh, trees, branches, sub-branches, leaves, and uh, complex, and 3D, and the large scale. 
And uh, I wanted to make this uh, forest in nanoscale with, with an, uh, metal. And uh, the forest are grown. First, you have uh, the seeds on the ground, seeds of the trees on the ground. And you give an uh, rain and the uh, sun shines, and then trees are grown, only where the light is illuminating. So you can uh, give the shape of the tree, uh, forest if you like. And as a result, you can give this one. So I wanted to do the same with a uh, silver or a, other, uh, a copper. So I wanted to make an artificial metallic nano forest. And uh, <coughs> this is a way to do. And uh, actually, this is not too new. Uh, chemists know the, uh, this process. Uh, and, uh, but we have uh, modified a lot. You have a grass substrate and, uh, and uh, not three seeds, but silver nano seeds of uh, a few nanometers. So we disperse silver nano seeds. And uh, you have an. Uh, uh, Rain, acetone, water, so with uh, including uh, silver ions and uh, ascorbic acid, and uh, nothing happens unless you give an UV light. If you give an UV light, the resonance of the localized mode of the surface plasmons of the silver is at 355. So if you give an 355, this is plasmonically resonates and heats up locally. And the heating up is producing the uh, growing crystallization of the silver along the axis. And then uh, ions are, metal ions are consumed, used to, 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 be, to reduce, to become the uh, crystals. And then there is a gradient, gradient in uh, density, and the silver ions are coming to uh, this uh, silver tree. And uh, if you have no surf surfactant, uh, you can have a uh, protrusion at this uh, tree. And uh, at the protrusion, another crystal grows, uh, following the crystal axis of the uh, silver. And uh, keep doing. Uh, you have an, uh, another, uh, many other protrusions along these uh, branches, and uh, you can have sub-branches and sub-sub-branches. So this is a, a mechanism to make a uh, silver nanotrees, nanoforest. And uh, uh, it's simple to do by chemistry. You have an uh, amino coating on the substrate, and, uh, and those fix silver nanoseeds and then uh, some of silver analysis and remove this, them by UV ozone cleaning and uh, coat methyl and replace them. And as a result on the substrate, there are some uh, silver uh, seeds with the size of a few nanometer. And they gave a uh, uh, silver ion solution on this uh, seeds. And then uh, gave an, a laser UV laser beam to irradiate this an area through the photo mask. And if the mask shape of the mask is, I don't know how many chains here, but this is this letter means tree. If you have three trees, it means forest. Okay, <laughs> this is true. OK, trust me, <laughs> this is true. So uh, this is, this is an, uh, after the irradiation and, uh, and all the process, you have made have an, uh, uh, this kind of an, a structure. Uh, so this includes silver, uh, silver trees inside. And uh, size is not limited, uh, limited by the mask and, uh, and the lens. But this is one millimeter by one millimeter. And uh, enlarged view of this part is this one. And another enlargement shows you the details of those trees. So this is really dense 
and uh, uh, plus since this is silver plasmonic and uh, and uh, and three uh, D, and uh, we remove the uh, uh, ethanol and others by uh, <laughs> supercritical uh, fluid washing, and we can have many of this kind of beautiful uh, trees in forest. And we have discussed a bit about the uh, fractal dimension of these nano trees, and, uh, and uh, it is like a 1.7 or 1.8, which is quite high density, uh, complicated. And uh, we have measured the extinction function of this uh, uh, dendrites, and uh, this is quite broad. At any frequency, any wavelength, the light is absorbed by these nanotrees because this has a different length of the uh, rods, I mean, uh, uh, branches. And uh, if no trees, uh, you have an nano seeds has an absorption here. And uh, after the growing, this uh, uh, absorption spectrum becomes this kind. And it can be decomposed by uh, typically four uh, different rods with different lengths. This is just as, a, as an example. But this is an, uh, uh, gives a broad spectrum, absorption spectrum. And the diffraction pattern, I don't know if you can see, it has an, uh, a hexagonal uh, representing uh, FCC structure of the silvers. So this is real silver uh, crystal. And uh, I show just one example uh, of the applications. And uh, this is an, uh, this is an uh, uh, foresty area. The outside is an, uh, uh, nothing except, uh, yes, uh, except some seas. And uh, inside, lots of trees. And if you give, and uh, we gave an uh, rhodium in 6G molecules here. And uh, inside, if you do the uh, Raman spectroscopy experiment, inside you see many, um, many uh, peaks of uh, the uh, vi uh, molecular vibration of the rhodium in 6Gs. And, uh, If you, we do the uh, me, uh, measurement for the enhancement, to know the enhancement factor, we did the experiment, and uh, it is like an, uh, uh, 5 million, so 10 to 6 times enhancement, enhanced by having the uh, silver. Without the silver, here you have an uh, experiment. Uh, uh, sorry, this is different. And uh, those peaks are represent, uh, identified by the vibration modes of the rhodium 6 gs And this is another experiment done uh, outside, outside the silver. Uh, this is optical image. Sorry, this is this is uh, same image. This is uh, optical. And uh, this one is an, uh, a spectrum obtained at the outside the tree. And what you see is an uh, uh, fluorescence, not uh, and uh, this should include some gamma, but it is too weak. So outside, you have a strong fluorescence by rhodium in 6G, but inside, fluorescence is quenched by silver, and the uh, Raman is still enhanced. So this can be used as a uh, uh, third substrate. And uh, I, in the last moment, I changed a lot of biographs, so I, I uh, didn't have the statement about negative refraction. Uh, sorry, I don't have a view. Maybe I have a view graph. Yes, uh, this is the one. Uh, the uh, tree has uh, branches, and this is sort of the uh, antenna to resonate and uh, giving the uh, magnetic field inside. Uh, to make a uh, negative refraction because giving the minus uh, 
permeability, uh, permeability mu. And uh, there's a discussion by uh, Professor Zhao in China and uh, that this kind of uh, tree structures produces uh, negative refraction. And, but we didn't do the experiment. And uh, our art structure is really 3D, so it's not easy. His case, it's in a 2D. But anyway, theoretically, it is possible to make a negative refraction. And, uh, but we didn't do it. But anyway, this is in a 3D uh, structures. And uh, one more example of the uh, self-growing uh, 3D fabrication. It was done many years before uh, by us. And uh, when I was working for two photon, two photon polymerization, I was interested in doing the experiment with an, uh, a single photon. And if you given a single photon in polymerizable resin, uh, if you focus the laser beam to the boundary, uh, the uh, beam, beam beam profile is in the cone, so you, focusing and, and uh, uh, diverging. So this is a uh, uh, light beam intensity distribution. But if you do the experiment, uh, polymerization, polymerized structure won't be in the cone shape. It becomes like this one, fiber. So it doesn't show the cone shape. It shows the fiber shape. And this is. And if you change the time of the exposure, the length changes. We repeated the experiment, and the length of the fiber changes. And uh, we said this is self-growing over fiber, and this can be explained by like this. If you focus the laser beam, polymerization starts at the highest light intensity position, and uh, it changes the uh, uh, refractive index. And this, uh, this uh, high refractive index part works as a uh, uh, lens to focus the light beam and give the light spot in front. And then polymerize the uh, uh, area, uh, volume in front of this uh, uh, part and growing. And the light is propagating through this uh, fiber as a uh, waveguide mode to emit the focused light at the end and keep growing. So this is a mechanism. This can be expressed by nonlinear shredding equations seen in color medium. And this can be said as an, a sort of spatial soliton, which was known at that moment. And we did the simulation. We did the simulation. So light beam is first a uh, uh, fan shape, but it is in a, uh, confined and uh, giving the uh, propagation with a fine, narrow thickness. And this is a resultant refractive index by introducing the uh, index change before and after of the materials and uh, power and others. And if you can make an uh, uh, fiber growing, we can do something else. If you give, if you change the condition, experimental condition, if you give a higher power, if you give a wider numerical aperture, the result does not become the cone shape. It becomes multiple number of the fibers. Because at the seeds you have an uh, inhomogeneity. And if you have an hom hom inhomogeneity, you make an, uh, uh, protrusions like the silver case. And this protrusion grows, gives a growing of the fiber. So it never becomes a thick volume of the uh, cone. It becomes many of fibers. So it is like a branching. And so, so change the power, you can change the uh, number of the fibers, all have the same thickness with us. And uh, also, if you can give two fibers growing and meeting at one point, it merges into one. Or if the position is a bit different, they are crossing. And uh, if the one is stronger than the other, the this, this uh, direction wins. 
And this one is stronger, this means. And uh, if they are equal in intensity, this goes in the middle. We did those kinds. And this can be explained again by the natural seeing as a river, river, river formation, river generation. In the river, uh, river, you, you know, the uh, water dig uh, ground and they make a river. But at this area, the condition is different. And uh, uh, angle is in a, uh, smaller. And uh, due to the inhomogeneity, you have in a branching. And uh, in the mountain area, they are, they are merging into. So they are not crossing. They are merging into. This is nonlinear, expressed by nonlinear equation. So, so similarly to this uh, river formation, we can make a uh, uh, fi fiber waveguide branching or waveguide merging and by controlling the uh, experimental uh, conditions. <coughs> yeah, I don't know this area where you have this kind at the Lake, uh, uh, Lake Man or not. So, so this is all what I have brought, but uh, one more topic if you, oh, where is he? Allow me to talk a bit more. Yeah, we still have five minutes, yeah. Okay. So the last topic is in a, a 3D optics for nano Raman microscopy of a living cell. I don't explain the details at all, but I worked uh, a lot with Olivier Marta for <laughs> near field optics, plasmonic optics, and uh, we have an, a, a Plasmonic, we made a plasmonic tip to show the special, high spatial resolution imaging. But uh, if you have a tip, it is it's limited to the imaging of the surface of the uh, sample, not to the inside. And the uh, biologist complained to me that uh, we don't want, you don't, we don't want, we want to see the inside, not to the surface. And why not in, uh, giving us the image, images of the inside? And uh, rather than using this tip, you, there is an answer. You have an, uh, if you have a small particle, it can be taken up inside, and uh, can be seen from outside. And the uh, problem is how do you control the movement of the particle inside the cell? Uh, meta, uh, this uh, like a 50 nanometer gold particle are taken up by cell by cell function. Cell takes. Uh, things outside, from outside to inside, to digest or whatever, to, to test, to check. And so it is taken up, but uh, how do you scan this one? And, uh, sorry, we tried, we, many years ago, we tried to do, uh, to scan this golden bead by laser force, laser force. If the particle is small enough, the particle, uh, even if the gold, it is trapped, gradient force wins the uh, uh, scattering force. But uh, this is still in the solution, not inside the cell. And the inside the cell, it is very impossible to scan the particle inside the, uh, with, scan the uh, cell with a particle inside. The cell refuses to be scanned. So we give up to move the particle by external force, and we leave the particle to move by itself. And it moves as an Brownian motion. And we follow the position of the particle precisely by tracking, and keep detecting the signal. Signal is the uh, Raman scattering uh, from the uh, molecules near to the gold particle. Gold particle enhances the Raman scattering by the plasma resonance and emit the uh, Raman signal of the molecules near the particle to the far field. And this is moving around. And I show you the uh, movie. So this is a particle moving. And we follow the position by uh, position sensitive detector, actually CCD. And during this uh, process, we keep measuring the Raman spectrum. And there is only one gold particle in the field. 
And then we keep irradiating this particle moving and measuring the Raman spectra. And keeping the Raman spectra at the every position of the motion of the particles. And sometimes particles are driven, taken up inside. And it stops. So this is inside the cell. And the mechanism can be explained. First, gold nanoparticle is taken up and uh, randomly moving, so the spectrum changes in time by change, and uh, know the positions. And then when it reaches to the uh, conveyor of uh, kinesin, dynesin, which transports the uh, whatever the uh, particles into deeply in the cell. So during this process, you see the quite identical Raman spectrum in time, and it is taken up to the uh, lysosome, which digest, try to digest the strangers, or, uh, yes. And then again, the spectrum stationary. So we did a kind of, this kind of experiment, and uh, we ma map in 3D. So this is a uh, 3D images of the uh, molecular, molecules inside the cell, only the uh, uh, cell pathway, not the entire volume of the cell. And uh, so this is experimental setup. Z is an, uh, uh, followed by uh, double focus system, and X, Y, X and Y are seen by CCD. And uh, by knowing the position, we <laughs> feedback the laser beam position to illuminate the uh, gold. So I skip this part, uh, and. Uh, uh, we are working a lot on these kinds. And I talked about the uh, nanofabrication by two photon, and uh, bottom approach, up approach is still, still uh, in the, in the uh, development by us. And uh, plasmonic nano imaging. So I'm more interested in, in general, 3D uh, nano with the light, with the optics. So we do some others. So this is the last few graph, I think. So, so I talked about optics for 3D and nano for you. Thank you very much. So thank you for this great overview of different uh, technologies and applications, uh, what can be done at the submicron and nanoscale. So I'm sure it has triggered a lot of questions, so there's time for questions. And I will walk around with the microphone that everybody watching live can also follow the questions. Hi, thanks for this fascinating talk. I was particularly in, uh, intrigued by the small scale and detail of your um, nanofabrication by polymerization, polymerization um, using the infrared laser. Um, so how is it possible to make um, spots that are small enough so that, that you can have 50 nanometer steps um, due to the physical um, uh, diffraction limit? So spot size is not 15 nanometer. Spot size is much uh, much wider. Of course, okay. but you have a threshold effect. Okay. Uh, you need some power of the light to do the propagation of the polymerization, and uh, uh, it depends on the time of the exposure. If you keep irradiating, the polymerization continues to make the size larger. So you carefully tune the power and and the time of the exposure. And, uh, and the dense concentration of the synthesizers and, uh, and uh, quenchers to stop the polymerization, many things. I see, but so. by tuning them, you can control the size down to, in this experiment, 120 nanometer. But other people have shown much higher, not much, but some, some higher resolution. So it's like something a fifth of the beam width or so? Sorry? It is something like a fifth of the beam width only that, that uh, is the effective size? Right. So this is not the issue of the resolution. We don't, we don't resolve the structure. So we eliminate one light beam and giving the threshold. 
And then you can, if you control the power of the laser, you can reduce the size much yeah. smaller than the wavelength of the light. Okay, fascinating. So the scanning system is an issue. Okay, okay. Well, fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I have a follow-up question on the uh, 3D with, um, uh, so you showed the, the femtosecond, uh, right? And it's, uh, femtosecond is expensive, although there are companies making these uh, devices. But you also demonstrated, uh, I don't think you've shown it, uh, with single photon fabrication. And uh, you haven't pointed out ex except for the fibers, but you've shown that you use um, uh, oxygen, I think, for inhibition to do the non effect. But you published only one paper or two and then you didn't follow up on this, and I will, I'm wondering why, you know, single photon, you know, 3D printing with this resolution, you know, did that somehow, you know, take up? Uh, we, I think we published only one paper on this uh, propagation uh, for my students to get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> And then I did not continue this topic. It, it is fun, but we did not get funded for this particular project. It's, it's, it's fun in science and fun to study, but not much practical for the practical applications. So we did not continue. We just showed the demonstration. And then we've been working more <coughs> two-photon stuff. But two-photon femtosecond laser was very expensive at that moment. So it was not possible that company would be interested in making. Ten years after, a uh, nanoscribe in Germany uh, started up a company and uh, did it in a, a successful business. Yes. Good morning. Great talk, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question to your paper in 2005 where you showed the parallel micro lens writing. Was it the same um, reason that you didn't follow up because it was for a PhD student? Or <laughs> because I haven't seen anything afterwards. So can you say something about the difficulty to do in parallel and what was the difficulties at that time? No, it was not difficult at all. Uh, we have demonstrated, and uh, uh, some company came to my press and I wanted to use that technology. And but scientifically, uh, we uh, we moved to making these parallel structures uh, made of a plastic, I mean polymers, to metallic structures, and then after after. After that, we coated these structures by metal. So we have some more publications. So how many lenses did you use that, uh, the array, how big was the uh, array? Depend on the experience. We, we had a piece of the micro lens array from a company, okay. and uh, we did not buy, we yeah. got it from them. And uh, we but had some, but. My question is because then you probably have less power or less intensity, yes, so you yes. need to write slower or longer? It took longer time, yes. But uh, power is high enough, actually, yes. Uh, even, even for two photon, femtosecond laser power is too high. You have to reduce a lot. So it, it wouldn't be a big problem. Okay, okay. It wasn't a big problem, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the simulations uh, which you did with uh, laser beam uh, propagation. Uh, I'm curious about uh, what uh, methods did you use uh, to make such simulations? Was it uh, FDTD or something else, uh, or maybe COMSOL? Ah, that's a good question. I totally forgot. <laughs> it was many years ago. Uh, no, it was not F. Uh, we have two papers with different probably approaches, and uh, 
Yes, this video was yes. quite impressive, yes. and I'm just curious. I think how... this is FDTD, but in this time we did three three kinds: FDTD and the boundary elementary method, and uh, and uh, uh, one more F FEM finite elementary method. And uh, I don't remember this particular result, which one gave this particular result. Probably FDTD, yeah. But this is simple. But it's, yes. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a statistician. I'm just curious <laughs> how it can be. And uh, this is done with my colleague, Yuri Kivusha, uh, in Australia. And uh, his, his postdoc, uh, Andriy Sokolov, has made the calculation. And uh, Satoru Shoji was the guy who did the experiment the first, yes. Yeah. Okay, many things. More questions? Yeah, there is one. Maybe a general question. So you you've shown two approaches. One is a uh, is self self assembly for large uh, areas, and the other is making very tiny point by point, right? Um, so what what do you believe is the answer to make you know metamaterials with uh, with metals in three D? Is it going from the little point by point, or or more into a um, you know a self assembly? Both have an, uh, uh, drawbacks and uh, point by point. Top down is fine to make an, uh, precise structures, but it is limited in practically the scale size and also three dimensionality. So, and also uh, you need machines, uh, instruments. And uh, self growing or self whatever, self um, bottom up approaches can be done without an expensive. Uh, Apparatus and uh, and uh, does not have a limit in scale, but it has a big limit in the shape which you can make, and uh, it's more theoretical study. Uh, we need uh, some some initial stage uh, patterns or many kinds, and uh, so those are still still apart, <laughs> not. Crossing and competing yet each other, yeah. and uh, uh, imaging also. Uh, the last example, uh, I work for Raman microscopes, and uh, it is really time-consuming. You need an, uh, for one pixel, you need an, uh, some some seconds to get an image, easily one hour, two hours, and uh, when something happens. You don't miss to see other part, only first line. So we need some some motion to uh, scanning scanning algorithm. But random motion is one of them. So uh, people always think to control the motions uh, or position alignment or everything uh, by by computer control. But sometimes uh, random movement may help to move the uh, to get the images. So. After, in particular, my retirement, I don't have enough. <laughs> so I have to think more a theoretical way to make the uh, alternative uh, method compared to the well-developed advanced uh, technologies. So, so these are not competing. These are uh, complementary, I hope. So I think if there are no more questions uh, at this uh, point, uh, this will be the end of the lecture. And I want to give a special thanks again to Professor Savata having uh, been joining us here. <laughs> Especially that I learned uh, that actually today is his birthday. And so we're very honored <laughs> to have him here at his own birthday.
So thank you very much uh, and see you next uh, month uh, where we will have at the same lecture series uh, Radhika Nakbal from uh, Harvard uh, University. Uh, the topic will be on uh, robotics uh, and we will be delighted to see you next month. Many thanks.